today we have um, communion with the little cups in front of you in the trays. For those of you who are unfamiliar, there's a little peel top for the bread and then a second peel top for the juice. Uh, offering trays are situated in the back and I'll be taking prayer requests on a paper instead of the cards all to try to be COVID friendly. Today was one of those mornings where absolutely anything that could go wrong did. So all of my email sermons that I sent out each week bounced back. And then during first service, when Sarah was trying to record, Zoom crashed. So it's going now. So keep Sarah and the Zoom and everything in your prayers. We're here today to worship the Lord. To that end, will you pray with me? Oh, gracious Lord, we look to you for help in the ordinary challenges and demands of life and in our day-to-day effort to find and do your will. And we look to you now for your special help in this service of worship, that we may be strengthened to do what life in general requires and what you show us to be special tasks to which we should put our hearts and our hands. Amen. Would you please stand and join together in singing our opening hymn. this week I was doing some cleaning around the house. They could really use it. And as I was cleaning, I got to looking around and I thought about the crosses that we had in our house. This one usually hangs in our kitchen. Someone special at church here made this and 
um, we have it hanging in our kitchen. This one often hangs on our front door as a reminder to us that um, we know Jesus and that he loves us. I have a cross necklace that I wear sometimes. It's another reminder. And another friend made this hat for my husband. And sometimes he wears this too as a reminder. And as I was looking at all these crosses this week, I was thinking about this um, story for, for the kids today and about the scripture that Bob's going to read in a few minutes. And it talks about when Jesus was talking to his disciples. And he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And I looked at the crosses again and I thought, I wonder if this is the cross that they were talking about. Just putting this on, does that make me a follower? Or if my husband wears this hat, does that make him a follower? And I thought, no, I think we need to go deeper than that. We need to understand that taking up our cross, what that meant to Jesus was that even though Jesus was divine, he gave up that divinity to come to earth, to live here on earth and become a servant. He came totally human down here and obedient. And that's what, too, is if we're taking up our cross, we want to be like Jesus. We want to be the person that serves others, that follows Jesus and is obedient unto Jesus. So when I wear my cross, that's a good reminder for me. Or when Gary wears his cross hat, it's a good reminder for him. But we don't just want to wear these. We want to live our lives showing people that we're willing to be a servant for Jesus. So let's remember that this week. Let's be servants for Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the example he set, for his love for us when he went to the cross. And this week, help us to live lives that reflect that to those we come in contact with. Amen. When Doug signed us up to uh, sing this Sunday, August 30th, I wasn't real sure. But then when he told me what song he wanted to do, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, the second verse says, if you get there before I do, tell all my friends I'm coming to. Then I knew that God had a hand in what we were doing this week. Because 10 years ago today, is a day that my sister Kay was killed in a motorcycle accident. And uh, my other two sisters and I will get together today and do some remembrances, but it's still a tough day for me. But I know that she got there before I did. So this song is dedicated to Kay Gay. And I know KK would have loved it. You know, she's kind of a party person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and with the pandemic and people being a little depressed and everything, JP, has it become a little heavier? Well, you know, I think you're right about the depression because, you know, I don't see a smile out there anywhere. Yeah, I think maybe we can speed it up a little bit. A little, maybe a little toe tap and pass four count. Maybe. Let's try that.
Thank you, Doug and Jackie. I love it. Both of our scripture passages today are pretty familiar. And so what I'd like to do is invite you to consider how they apply to you today. Not only get into the word, but let the word get into you. Will you pray with me for illumination? Lord, be with us now as we study your holy word. Grant us wisdom so that we might understand your truths. Grant us discernment so that we might truly see ourselves as well as the people around us. And grant us compassion so that we might freely share with them what we learn here today. In your son's name we ask this. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. It's titled, Moses and the Burning Bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, a priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. 
And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. And our second lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. It's titled, Jesus Predicts His Death. It comes on the heels of Peter's good confession. Matthew 16, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You ever watched a child with a freshly opened box of assorted chocolates? Concentration is intense, as is the dilemma, which one should I take? Maybe the biggest one, or that small, round one. It might be filled with my favorite peppermint cream. Or how about the long, skinny one? It might last longer. Or that light brown colored one with the caramel inside? Which one should I choose? How do I decide? And as an adult, a child's dilemma might seem trivial to us, although I have seen more than a few adults stare longingly at a box of Fannie Mae chocolates. But we usually have a broader perspective, don't we? We see choices from a much larger point of view. And that is the fundamental parameter in making choices, isn't it? How broad really is your perspective? So I wonder if we ever glimpse things from an eternal point of view. In order for you to be a Christian, says the Lord to those who love him, you have to deny yourself and willingly take up your cross. If you want to follow me, be one of my disciples, that's the choice you have to make. You need to consider the concerns of God, not the concerns of men, and especially not your own concerns. You see, it's like this. Whoever wants to save their life will actually lose it. But whoever is willing to lose their life for me will truly find life. That's pretty serious, isn't it? We are so good at thinking of ourselves. But Jesus says, unless your concerns are those of God. They're not from an eternal perspective and therefore not worth having. 
choice is yours, though. It's your decision. It's totally up to you. But it is decision time, says Jesus. I need your answer right now. Are you willing to make that kind of commitment? Think it through, though, before you answer, because what could you possibly give in exchange for your soul? Will you follow me or not? Be my disciple or not? Will you choose to deny yourself or not? Will you freely take up whatever cross Almighty God sets before you? Or will you turn and walk away? Can you feel the magnitude in that question? That decision before them? That decision before you, really, and me? Can you see it through an eternal lens? I wonder. Martin Luther King Jr. had a phrase for a time like this. He called it the fierce urgency of the now. I wonder if we can sense that, that urgency. And here's the thing. The ramifications of your decision will only unfold over time. You simply will not completely understand what all this means just yet. That doesn't change anything, though. You still need to choose. You see? The fierce urgency of the now. The disciples are in Galilee, not too far from Caesarea Philippi, where we saw them last week, still on the edge of Gentile territory. They're in the north, near where most of them grew up. It's lush and beautiful there, a lot more green, far more trees than there are downstate. The sky is often deep, rich shade of blue, just like yesterday. Cool breezes tend to roll in off of the water and bathe the entire area inland for miles. Maybe you can imagine a place like that. Only it's the Mediterranean Sea, not Lake Michigan. But picture taking a vacation there with Jesus when suddenly he drops a bombshell. I'm going to Jerusalem, down to the capital. There I'll be handed over to the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will put me through a time of immense agony and tremendous suffering, which, with the help of the Romans, will culminate in a most horrific death. I'll be crucified, nailed to a cross, and set up on a hill. I'm going to die in a most ghastly way. And then on the third day, I will rise from death to new life. And what I need from you is a decision. Are you willing to follow me on this journey? Will you choose to be one of my disciples? Will you go where I go and do what I do? Will you take up your cross when the time comes and freely carry it like I'm about to do with mine? The path before me is clear, he says, but then so is the one before you, even if you can't see it just yet. It's a path called obedience, a path of humility, a path of self-sacrifice in the name of the Father. My journey leads to glory, and so can yours, but it only does so by way of the cross. And I need your answer right now. Just as an aside, when you're sharing the gospel, the good news with someone for the very first time, you know, introducing them to Jesus, this may not be your best go-to text. I mean, it doesn't exactly make you want to run around and sign up, does it? Imagine the shock for the disciples. Picture the expressions on their faces. Here's the mission, folks. These are your marching orders. Your assignment is really quite clear. Now it's decision time, so let me make that clear as well. Will you follow me faithfully and obediently, or will you take off in the opposite direction? Will you embrace whatever hardships come your way, humbly stoop down as low as you need to go, and pick up your cross? And will you then carry it in unconditional love wherever I tell you to go? Can you imagine hearing that at a crusade or a revival? Tell me, would you go forward during the altar call? This isn't about buying a t-shirt with the team name on it or our corporate logo. This has nothing to do with putting a fish symbol bumper sticker on the back of your car or carrying a Bible around or wearing a cross necklace even. This is actually about shouldering a cross yourself, a big one maybe. 
This is a choice, a lifestyle choice. You either follow me or you don't. You can't hide in the anonymity of the crowd at what feels like a safe distance. You're either in the game or you're out. There's no watching from the sidelines, not if you want to be one of my disciples. I'm calling you to a brand new way of life. In fact, I'm going to give up my life in order to accomplish the work of the Lord. And what I'm calling you to do is the very same thing. You know, now that I think about it, maybe this would be a good introductory scripture to share with a new believer. I mean, it's honest, right? And truthful. Certainly can't accuse Jesus of deceptive advertising. He doesn't sugarcoat the mission here at all. Following Jesus requires self-denial. Requires service to others in his name. It may even very well lead to a cross. That's what you're signing up for. Regardless of what you may have heard on the radio, Christianity is not a technique designed to deliver prosperity, nor is it a magic formula that will instantly whisk away all of life's problems. This isn't some kind of key that unlocks the secret door of happiness, and not at least not on this side of heaven, although joy and peace are certainly side effects of the obedience. Those who follow Jesus follow him towards the cross. And cross bearers, according to Thomas Long, a prominent preacher, are those who, quote, forfeit the game of power before the first inning even begins. Christians are dropouts from the school of self-promotion. And now we have to each decide. Some holiday in the north part of the state, right? It's no wonder Peter freaks out. Jesus flat out says, you have in mind, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, your simple solutions, your human solutions, the latest fad, the next wave of Christian ethics, your five-step plan on church growth, your new development model isn't going to cut it. This isn't about playing church, no matter what you may have heard. What you have in mind are the concerns of men Following me is different, very different. It deals with the concerns of my father. And poor Peter, I sort of feel sorry for him, don't you? He's not trying to upset the apple cart here. He's just trying to find another way forward, an easier way forward. He's one of Jesus' closest friends, and now there's all this talk about suffering and pain. There has to be a better plan, right? Right? Peter doesn't like the idea of this cross thing one bit, not for Jesus, and certainly not for himself. So from the very depths of his soul, he cries out, never, Lord, never. This shall never happen to you. In essence, God forbid, Jesus. This will never happen by God. I don't want you to suffer, Lord. I'm not real keen on the idea of me suffering either. Can you... Imagine his frantic emotion. Can you blame him? Can you relate? Peter's the rock, remember? The one Jesus is grooming to be the leader of this fledgling church, the one who Jesus has just called blessed. And he just made the good confession, remember, and in turn received high praises from his Lord. Peter is just trying to think of a way to shield Jesus from the pending tragedy. If that's what awaits us in Jerusalem, Lord, then let's head in the other direction. We could go to the hills, maybe, or stay here at home. We could hide out, for heaven's sake, so we could just lay low until it blows over. Or we could raise an army, Lord, and fight. We can protect you, Lord. We can keep you out of harm's way. Let's be proactive here, Jesus. Let's do everything we can in order to avoid this terrible suffering and pain. It's fight or flight, right? It's human nature. Makes perfect sense from a human point of view. To which Jesus answers, Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the concerns of God. Remember early on in Jesus' ministry how Satan tried to upset God's plan? Remember the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness immediately following his baptism? 
Satan said, go make a big splash, Jesus. Toss yourself off of this wall so that everyone will know who you are. Satan said, turn these rocks into bread. Put the focus on the miracles. Put the focus on yourself. Satan said, come in power, Jesus. Take over the world. I will set you up as the ruler of everything. To which Jesus answered by saying, no. My way is the way of humility. My way leads to a cross. None of that is part of the plan, Satan. Conflict avoidance is not what this faith thing is all about. I have a mission. We have a mission. And sacrifice and conflict, making waves may very likely be part of that mission. My followers need to travel whatever path the Father lays out before us. It won't do a lick of good to make everything all comfy and cozy and good if that requires acting outside of the Father's will. I can relate to Peter. Can't you? I think most of us probably can. Our fears, our doubts, our self-doubts even often get in the way. And sometimes, out of a concern for others, or more often out of a concern for ourselves, we try to avoid whatever great big burning bush God plants right in front of us. I think we often try to ignore our marching orders, don't you? Even if they're obvious and clear, we might decide to run and hide instead or kick and scream, or we might try to explain away why that particular burning bush doesn't really apply to me or us. We make excuses, don't we? Just like Peter did. And come to think of it, just like Moses did as well. I used to picture Moses as a real hero type, a John Wayne or Arnold Schwarzenegger. For those of you who are old enough, a Charlton Heston. I mean, God used this mover and shaker to further his plan of salvation, right? In some pretty amazing ways. He goes toe-to-toe with the most powerful man on the face of the planet. He storms into Pharaoh's palace and demands the release of all the Israelite slaves. And when Pharaoh balks, Moses sends the fear of God into him, literally, along with some pretty nasty plagues. Moses turns one of the largest rivers in the world into blood, sends frogs and gnats and flies, locusts and boils, and even hail upon the land of Egypt and upon its people. And when all that fails to work, Moses, as a messenger of the Lord, announces a plague of death on the firstborn in the country. Moses must have been fearless, right? Like Peter, the founder of the church. No way he's like you and me. But then I noticed that when God first approached him here at the burning bush, Moses hid his face. Can you relate? And when God gave him his marching orders, Moses immediately started coming up with excuses. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Suppose I go, and the Israelites question my authority. What shall I tell them? What if they don't listen to me? Lord, I've never been eloquent. You know that. Neither in the past nor now. I'm slow of speech and tongue, Lord. You know that too. Oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. And God replies, I know your failings, Moses as well as your inadequacies, in fact, quite well. That's why I chose you. You cannot do it without me. Who do you think gave you your mouth anyway? Who makes people deaf and dumb? Who gives them their sight? Now go. I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. Just tell the people that I am who I am. Tell the people that I am the Lord. I mean, let's face it, Moses had issues, right? Just like we do. He came from a broken home. A police report would say that he was abandoned by his parents and tossed into the river. The newspaper would surely use the word dysfunctional, I'm sure. He was then adopted, raised by a wealthy family, a controlling family who wielded great power and prestige. Moses had a decent education, though, and spent the first 40 years of his life living in the lap of luxury, living in the 
He was waited on hand and foot. And then one day, while supervising other people at work, he had a fit of rage and killed a man. No way are we like Moses at all, right? He spent the next 40 years of his life as a fugitive, running away from those in authority, hiding out in some of the most inhospitable places on the planet. He farmed and raised sheep, worked as a hired hand. And there's no record of him having a relationship with God during that time. He was 80, notice, when he got his marching orders at the burning bush. He was out in the middle of the ordinary and mundane, tending the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro. He wasn't searching for God on a mountaintop or praying diligently for divine intervention. He was simply doing what he normally did. And God, in a most unexpected way, called his name. Nah, we're not like Moses at all. Moses did, however, choose to obey. He chose to follow his marching orders, even when it wasn't easy, even when they weren't particularly clear. One commentator actually said Moses spent the first 40 years of his life thinking that he was a somebody. Then he spent the next 40 years of his life realizing that he was a nobody. And then, through obedience, Moses spent the last 40 years of his life being a somebody for God. He was transformed by God's power and God's grace through obedience. And I think there might just be a lesson there. Today we see Jesus revealing himself for who he really is, the Son of God, who is on his way to the cross. More pointedly, maybe, today we hear him calling us to follow the very same path. I guess you could call Jesus crazy if you wanted to, a fanatic whose actions prove to be deadly, but you cannot simply label him a great moral example or a fine ethical teacher. I mean, how many Nobel Prize winners or PhD recipients or doctors or teachers, gurus or imams, rabbis or pastors even, how many great moral examples would willingly die for you on a cross? You can claim that Jesus was an honest social critique, critic, or a religious reformer even, or a visionary who was way ahead of his time, but that just misses the point, doesn't it? and only lessens the impact of his self-sacrificial giving? No, our faith calls us to see Jesus as more than some kind of ideal, someone to base our values on. Our faith calls us to see him as Lord and to take our marching orders from him seriously. And that, in the end, all comes down to that choice, doesn't it? Will I follow Jesus in the way of the cross, or will I turn and walk away? Will I shout, God forbid, like Peter, and look for an easier way? Will I try to hide my face like Moses, or ask God to send someone else? Or will I, in faith, realize just who it is that's calling and see things from an eternal perspective, and then, in faith, step out in obedience? Will I bend down and gladly embrace my cross, stoop as low as I need to and pick it up, and then follow wherever my Lord calls? That's the choice, isn't it? And all of God's people said, Amen. I invite you to listen for the Holy Spirit nudging your hearts and if God so nudges you as we sing to make a confession of faith or to reaffirm one you've made earlier in your life or to simply join membership of this body of believers, please come forward as we do. Will you stand?
No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. No one go winning, I still will follow. Go with me, I still will follow. Don't go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Each week we come together as a family of God and we share with one another our joys and concerns and lift them up before the Lord in prayer. In first service today, Jackie Eardman lifted up uh, her son, Jason, who had some good test results, and her sister, Jill, who's recuperating from surgery. And Bob Bodell asked for prayers for Brooke, a friend of theirs uh, who is sick, and they were worried might have COVID. Um, I'm going to put my mask on so I can walk out there. Are there others that we would like to share today? Sonia. Bev? We'll keep Bev lifted up. Thank you. Linda. For those of you who didn't hear, Jim Byers, I'm um, dealing with some severe health issues. We'll keep him lifted up in our prayers. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. There's a lot going on there. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. Good reminders. If you please join me in silent prayer. Thank you for whispering to our hearts, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us through the experiences of our daily lives. And thank you for calling out to each of us by name. As we hear your voice, Lord, please empower us with your Holy Spirit to respond in ways that are pleasing to you. Please equip us to serve in your name. Please encourage us to step out in faith. And please comfort us as we face trials and tribulations along the way. Father, you've walked with us this past week. You've shared in the experiences that we've had. 
You've been there when we needed your hand and you've witnessed both the joys and the sorrows that we've experienced. You've stood beside us sharing in our lives. You've walked before us, leading us down your paths, and you've been behind us, nudging us on, always ready to catch us if we stumble and fall. You've been there for us and with us, Lord, in each moment of our lives. Now help us to be here for you. Because you are ever present with your people, Lord, you already know the things that are burdensome to our hearts. You know the problems that we face, and you know the people that we love, and you know the deep desires of our hearts. So all of these we place before you now. We lift up Jason and Jill and Brooke and Bev. We place before you Jim Byers and all teachers and parents and students everywhere, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, for your mercy, and for your grace. We also lift up before you all the people that are silently on our hearts right now. And we lift up each person here, Lord, as well, each member of this congregation, each portion of the body of Christ. And we lift up especially all those who do not yet know you and those who have turned their face away. We ask that you will touch their lives too powerfully and immediately. We ask that you will bring to them the word of life and empower us to do the same. We place these things before you in Jesus' name as we pray now the very prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus invites us to follow him, to take up our cross. And he invites us to come to this table with him, to feel his power, to experience his presence, to enjoy his love. As we share the words of institution today, please feel free to partake of communion, pulling the little tab on the top and taking the bread and then pulling the second one and partaking of the juice. Or if you feel more comfortable, please feel free to take the communion with you and partake later. God tells us, I am your refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. The psalmist says, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. God knows we can't do it on our own. He's there to help us and to guide us. And this table is the best example. Jesus took our pain and our punishment, allowing us to run freely to God without shame or fear. Let us pray. Oh God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come to you, that you are there, you are our, our help. You provided a way for us to be with you. God, help us to step out in faith, knowing you are there to help us in everything that we do. Let us run to you and not run away. We ask this in Jesus' name. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup, and after giving thanks for it, he gave this to his disciples, and he said, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. These things do in remembrance of me.
Our benediction today comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 and following. I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, and I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen.